Hello and welcome to this Science AAAS webinar. My name is Sean Sanders and I'm the commercial editor at Science. In this webinar presentation, we will be taking a look at how subtle changes in gene sequence can affect the translation and expression of encoded proteins through mechanisms including codon bias, mRNA stability, and translation initiation. Natural gene sequences have been shaped in response to many different evolutionary pressures, but are rarely optimal for aspects of biotechnological fitness such as maximized protein yield or optimal expression control. In this webinar, our expert guests will discuss the current understanding of the subject and ways in which this can shape strategies to design genes for applications ranging from synthetic biology to protein crystallography. In the studio today, I have with me three exceptional and very knowledgeable panelists to discuss this topic. Uh, to my left is Dr. Joshua Plotkin from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, next, we have Dr. Christine Vogel from the University of Texas. And finally, Dr. Mark Welsh from the company DNA 2.0. Many thanks to you all for being with us in the studio today. A reminder to everyone watching that uh, to see an enlarged version of any of the slides, you can click on the Enlarge Slides button located underneath the slide window of your web console. You can also download a PDF copy of the slides by using the Download Slides button. If you're joining us live, you can submit a question to the panel at any time by typing it into the Ask a Question box on the bottom left of your viewing console, below the video screen, and clicking the Submit button. As always, please do keep your questions short and to the point. I'll get to as many of them as possible during the Q&A session following the talks. Finally, thank you to DNA 2.0 for their sponsorship of today's webinar. And now I'd like to introduce our first speaker for this webinar, Dr. Joshua Plotkin. Dr. Plotkin completed his undergraduate degree in mathematics at Harvard University in Massachusetts, followed by a PhD in applied and computational mathematics from Princeton. He completed a junior fellowship back at Harvard University before moving on to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia to take the position of assistant professor of biology and computer science. Currently, Dr. Plotkin is the Martin Mayerson Assistant Professor of Interdisciplinary Studies at the University of Pennsylvania, where he studies evolutionary biology using mathematical and computational approaches with a focus on the origin and maintenance of genetic variation in populations. Dr. Plotkin has served as an associate editor for the Journal of Molecular Evolution since 2006. Welcome to you, Dr. Plotkin. Thank you very much, Sean, and thank you for hosting the webinar. So I'll be speaking today about some recent work on the coding sequence determinants of gene expression. This is work that's been pursued in collaboration with my postdoc, Jagorsh Kudwa, who is responsible both for the design and the execution of most of the experiments I'll discuss, as well as our collaborators, Andrew Murray and David Tollery. What we've been interested in is perhaps best introduced by discussing the genetic code first. The genetic code is, of course, something that we all know and love. It is a standard and, for the most part, universal mapping between the gene sequence and the encoded amino acid or peptide sequence of a protein. By contrast to that, and this is a well-understood um, code, we might discuss the expression code. That is to say, the relationship between synonymous mutations in the gene sequence and the expression level of the resulting encoded protein. It is known, for example, that synonymous mutations, although not changing the encoded protein sequence, can nevertheless have a very large and substantial effect on the resulting expression level of the protein. However, the exact workings of this expression code are poorly understood. It's certainly at least species-specific and possibly even condition-specific. There is, however, <clears throat> a, a large body of theoretical and background literature about hypotheses for the expression code, pr principally probably the theory of codon adaptation. That's a theory that posits that genes encoded by codons that have so-called high codon adaptation, that's to say codons that match the relative abundances of isoaccepting tRNAs, will be expressed at high levels, whereas genes encoded by codons of low codon adaptation that have a poor match to the abundances of isoaccepting tRNAs will be expressed at low levels. And there certainly is some strong evidentiary support for this classical theory arising principally from tRNA replacement experiments. To test this and many other theories, we wanted to ask in a systematic way what features of coding sequences influence expression levels. And to do this in a systematic and somewhat unbiased way, we had the following very simple experimental plan. Our idea was to synthesize a large library of proteins, all encoding the exact same protein, in this case GFP, but introduce in random, in random locations synonymous mutations, express these constructs in a cell line starting with E. coli, and thereby systematically interrogate how codon usage influences transcription, MNRI stability, translation, and all the processes that lead to eventual protein synthesis. 
to build this library, <coughs> we did a, a very simple protocol called Degenerate PCR, where we ordered all the goes that have um, degeneracies in the third positions that are silent. An example of such oligos is shown here. We overlap these oligos to produce an entire gene sequence. Here's an example alignment from this library, just illustrating the kind of sequence diversity we have amongst the 150 or so constructs that we produced through this synthesis protocol. You'll see that in the first and second positions, the gene constructs are entirely conserved. However, in the third position, at synonymous sites, there's substantial random variation associated with these genes. I should hasten to emphasize that the, random, the, that the mutations introduced through this protocol are in many ways completely random, which is a contrast to the kinds of experiments we'll hear a little bit later today from Mark. We've introduced random mutations to see how they influence expression levels. The resulting constructs we have, um, GFP constructs, span to a large degree, at least with respect to GC content and the codon adaptation index, a large range, almost the full range of expression of variation in the endogenous genes in the E. coli genome. So in some ways, the construct library is representative of the endogenous E. coli genome. We then express these constructs in E. coli cells, starting with an in vitro recombination reaction based on the gateway set system. We grew E. coli overnight in quadruplicate, um, induced expression by IPTG, and measured fluorescence a certain amount of time post-induction, in this case, three hours. The resulting constructs showed a large variation in their fluorescence. Here, just as an example, is an image, a photograph of a 96-well plate showing different constructs in quadruplicate. And you can see that there's visibly a lot of variation in the fluorescence or protein levels. Indeed, across the whole library, there's around 250-fold variation in the fluorescence levels, all, again, all arising from synonymous mutations. In every case, these proteins encode the same wild-type GFP sequence. I should also add that these fluorescence levels were highly reproducible across different experimental conditions, different temperatures, different initiation times, and so on. And moreover, they were verified by Western blotting and Kumasi and other ways of estimating protein levels. So we believe that they're fairly accurate representations of the protein levels. The first thing we found, and this was somewhat of a surprise to us, is that the codon adaptation index, the measure of um, codon adaptation, was not at all correlated with the protein levels or the fluorescence levels in our data. Though this was a surprise to us, maybe to some um, people in the biotechnology biotech literature, it would not have been a surprise to people like Bulmer, who as early as 1991 suggested that initiation as opposed to elongation is rate limiting in protein production. And so we should not expect that having more well-adapted codons and slightly increasing the elongation rate will actually have any effect on the resulting protein levels. And indeed, we did not observe any such effect. By contrast, we did find, and this was by far the predominant feature in our data, that the energy associated with mRNA folding near the five prime end of the messages was strongly correlated with fluorescence. Those constructs that, have more, that had more tightly folded messages, particularly in the region from nucleotides minus 4 to 37 relative to start, were expressed at much lower levels. And this, again, may not have been a surprise to people like Anderson and Kurland or Air Walker and Bulmer, who also argued and hypothesized based on the patterns of nucleotide content in endogenous genomes that there's a large amount of pressure for particular codon usage to help initiate translation. Just to give you a feeling, here are some images of the particular computationally predicted RNA structures associated with the five prime ends of the messages, both for a very low expression construct on the left and a high expression construct on the right. We could be a little bit more precise about this. In a sort of very simple moving window analysis, we asked what region of the sequence had the strongest correlation between its folding energy and the resulting fluorescence levels. And indeed, we found that the region right in the five prime area had by far the strongest such correlation. And this region overlaps substantially with the known ribosomal binding site of G uh, in E. coli, which makes a lot of mechanistic sense. So this, these results raise the possibility that endogenous E. coli genes may have already undergone selection to reduce 5' prime mRNA structure. And indeed, consistent with this hypothesis, we did observe that in the endogenous E. coli genome, the free energy associated with folding right the 5' prime region of, of endogenous genes was significantly stronger than the, that, than the um, structure was significantly weaker in the endogenous genes in the first 5' um, prime region than immediately downstream, suggesting that many, if not most, in E. coli genes have already undergone um, selection for weak structure at their beginning. At the same time, however, there's a whole lot of variation in expression levels left unexplained in our own data set and indeed in the E. coli genome that has nothing to do probably with 5' energy. 
So where does that leave the theory of codon adaptation? I mentioned codon adaptation was not correlated with fluorescence levels, but it was, however, strongly correlated with the gro growth rate of cells expressing different GFP constructs. Again, this makes some sense in retrospect. The idea is that cells expressing constructs with poor codon adaptation will require a large number of ribosomes to be translated. Translation will proceed more slowly. And such cells will have a dearth of ribosomes that they need to, to translate essential proteins, reducing um, their fitness and their growth rate. Although that's one interpretation of these data, there certainly are other interpretations. It could, for example, have been that low codon adaptation resulted in a lot of mistranslation-induced misfoldings, which may have been toxic to the cell, again, reducing cellular fitness. This was a hypothesis raised by Drummond et al. and discussed um, by a large number of people recently. In our data, in our particular data set, however, we did not find any relationship between the degree of codon adaptation of a construct and our simple measures of mistranslations, such as the ratio of functional fluorescent protein to, co to total protein assayed by Kumasi. Nonetheless, the possibility certainly remains that an undetectably small amount of mistranslation-induced toxicity could be imposing a large fitness cost in the cells, an amount that we cannot simply assess with our measurements so far. So in summary, I just want to highlight the basic points of this particular study, and that's that codon adaptation was not observed to correlate with expression in the fly, whereas 5' mRNA structure had a predominant effect on gene expression in our data. And again, our data are based on random mutations, and on such mutations, this was the strongest single mechanistic explanation we could find for our data. At the same time, there's a significant amount of rigid residual expression variation left unexplained, which hopefully we'll hear a little bit about from Mark later today. And finally, poor codon adaptation is observed to reduce cellular fitness, likely by imposing a load on the ribosomal pool, but other mechanisms are certainly possible. So again, I want to close just by thanking my wonderful collaborators in this research, as well as our funding sources. Thanks, Sean. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Plotkin. Uh, we're going to move right on to our second speaker, and that today is Dr. Christine Vogel. Dr. Vogel completed her master's in biochemistry at the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena, Germany, and a second master's in mathematical biology at University College London in the United Kingdom. She then pursued a PhD at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge in the UK. In 2005, she joined Edward Marcotte's lab at the University of Texas at Austin as a postdoctoral fellow. Currently, Dr. Vogel works as a research associate, and her scientific interests revolve around the use of quantitative shotgun proteomics to decipher global and specific regulation of protein expression and stability. She has acted as an associate editor for PLOS Computational Biology and as an associate member of Faculty of a Thousand. Very welcome to you, Dr. Vogel. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Proteins determine the properties of our cells, and protein expression regulation can be summarized in nothing smaller than the central dogma of biology, which describes transcription of RNA from DNA and then translation of proteins from RNA. The human genome encodes about 2,000 transcription factors, and people have been studying uh, transcription regulation for many years. However, the human genome also encodes 600 proteins with RNA binding proteins, many of which are RNA or translation regulators. So what we are interested in in our lab is what I would call the second half of the central dogma of biology, which concerns the production of proteins from mRNAs via translation and then the degradation of proteins by other processes. So these two major processes themselves are regulated by a plethora of mechanisms. And this is illustrated in the slide where we see a eukaryotic mRNA. So in contrast to our previous talk, we're now deal, uh, talking about eukaryotes. Translation is in initiated at the cap structure at the 5' end of the mRNA, or there's also cap-independent translation. We have the ribosomes binding to the translation initiation site at the coding strand, but there can also, in, there can also be internal ribosome entry sites or internal upstream open reading frames in the 5' UTR where the ribosome gets stalled, initiates translations, thus suppresses translation of the main um, uh, coding strand. And then, as we've just heard already, um, secondary structures both in the 5' UTRs as well as in other regions of the sequence can influence translation levels. Codon usage and nucleotide sequences are important as well as we hear today. And um, regulators such as microRNAs or also RNA binding proteins bind primarily to the 3' end but also to the 5' end to regulate translation. <coughs> 